Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russ Doney, product mangler in the Grill Business Unit, working with Emerging Technologies. Yeah, I'm Javier Martinez, I'm a software engineer working on the bootloader uh, team. So if your machine fails to boot, probably I am someone to blame. And what we'd like to do today is uh, talk about a hardware root of trust, and specifically about doing useful things <clears throat> with the hardware root of trust. Uh, this is our second year. We're back. And last year, we were talking about technology. We were talking about uh, the neat things that can be done with some of the new technology. And we were basically here with the message of, it's real this time, trust us. Well, we're back, it's real this time, and we've got some solid things to show. Last year, we were doing technology preview of the Trusted Platform module in uh, Fedora. We were showing a preview of the uh, network-bound disk encryption using the hardware root of trust, again, in Fedora, and talking about wonderful future. So, <clears throat> we've heard talks like this before. So, what's happened since then? Since the last DEF CONF, <clears throat> network-bound disk encryption with TPM 2.0 support has been shipping in uh, Fedora in RHEL 7.6 and will be included in the future version of RHEL who cannot be named yet. <clears throat> Some of the recent developments are we have added measurement of the boot path to the uh, system and we'll be talking about that, both um, why you care, what it is, and <clears throat> how it works. We actually have customers using this. There are customers using the capabilities of the TPM2 to protect <coughs> secrets, a uh, variety of secrets, notably keys of different parts, but they're also, uh, some people, even using the advanced sealing capabilities. One of the traditional challenges with using the hardware root of trust has been that they've been very difficult to program and you have no idea of where to get started. So <coughs> we're going to help you with that. We're going to be talking about uh, signing with TPM2. And these slides are falling off the bottom, so we're missing some of the other really important points. Oh, so maybe we can change. Um. So as he's uh, correcting, uh, updating the resolution, a little bit of background would be useful. TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, has been around for about 12 or 15 years. There are two versions of it. The initial broadly based one is TPM 1.2, of which billions are shipped, hundreds are used. So there's some excellent capabilities in TPM 1.2, but they're almost theoretical because they are so bloody difficult to use. TPM 2 builds on the foundation of TPM 1.2. It provides additional capabilities, notably uh, crypto agility but it also has a set of characteristics that make it dramatically easier to use and dramatically more useful, and we'll be talking about uh, those in here. As part of TPM2, uh, there are two user space libraries that have emerged. The early work for user space library to work with TPM2 uh, was done by IBM and was a um, IBM uh, development. The Trusted Computing Group, TCG, the developers of uh, TPM specifications, including 1.2 and 2.0, have developed their own <coughs> user space uh, specification, which we believe will be the standard user space interface for uh, working with TPM2. And <coughs> this has been uh, implemented. Uh, to give them credit, Intel has done the majority of the work in implementing the TCG 2.0 uh, user space specification. We are shipping both the um, IBM TPM2 user space and the TCG Intel TPM user space in Fedora and in RHEL. However, um, our primary focus in developing tools and applications is using the TCG uh, user interface. So in summary, the uh, focus at Red Hat around doing useful things with TPM is based on TPM 2.0 hardware and API and the <coughs> TCG user space. Another interesting note, since oh, this, this may actually fit in with the theme of uh, ease of use, is that there is a fairly widely used interface called PKCS 11. So PKCS 11 <coughs> is intended to provide a platform independent interface to a variety of security tokens. 
So it's trying to provide a standardized interface that can be used across a range of devices. Basic capabilities um, would be implemented on smart cards, on hardware security modules. Uh, anyone here have a YubiKey, YubiKeys, and uh, PPMs? It has a fairly basic set of capabilities that address the use case of creating, modifying, and deleting keys and tokens. This would include things like um, RSA keys, X5.509 certificates, and so forth, and is very widely used by certificate authorities. So <clears throat> this is uh, useful, and there's some work underway to <clears throat> provide a PKCS 11 interface to TPM. Now, this would be to a subset, a relatively small subset of uh, TPM capabilities, but a very useful and important subset. Also note that the um, PKCS 11 work is building on top of the um, TPM user space, the TCG user space stack, so it's not a question of whether to use uh, the native TPM API or to use uh, PKCS 11, it's which is the best choice for the specific problem you're working with. An example of this is that you can have something, a user application, GNU TLS is an entirely non-random example, and the PKCS 11 interface would allow you to use the same interface to talk to smart cards, to talk to the GNOME keyring daemon, and to talk to uh, trusted platform modules. So it's one of the things that uh, is being worked on to try to make TPM more useful. Now, if anyone is interested in actually developing software that uses TPM2, we have a cheat sheet for you. Traditionally, <clears throat> the most difficult space or place getting started with using these things is where to get started. <clears throat> what do I need to set up? What do I need to initialize? What do I need to interact with it? What are the commands? How do I know if it's working? What do I do when um, I'm pounding my head against the brick wall trying to get something that should be obvious to work and it's just not cooperating? <clears throat> we hear you and <clears throat> there is uh, work that as a side effect is really benefiting people who need the capabilities of TPM no, <clears throat> don't know quite where to get started. We're going to be talking about network-bound disk encryption and specifically the uh, Clevis module. And it turns out that it's almost a side effect of the problem it's intended to solve. Clevis is a crypto framework with uh, some very useful capabilities. It has considerable flexibility. We've seen more about that. And a number of the uh, Clevis functions have been implemented to use TPM as well as the uh, Tang server for the back end and other work is being explored for the future. So what this means is that the Clevis code base is a really good starting point for working with the TPM. Clevis has gone in and implemented the most common functions that you would be interested in working with TPM so there's code sitting there ready to be stolen. I mean, there is a reference implementation that you can look at to determine exactly what is needed to get these things up and running. Now, in addition to working directly with TPM, Clevis is a good reference point for working with other parts of crypto, such as the uh, Jose uh, specification, the uh, Java web encryption, uh, Shamir secret sharing, and we'll be showing an interface to uh, UDISCs too, so there's uh, quite a bit of good stuff in there. GitHub.com slash latch set slash clips. Javier, what the hell is a TPM? Yes, as Russell said, last year we talked in detail about the TPM2 software stack, different layers and libraries that it compounds. So this year we are not going to cover that, but instead show some of the applications of TPMs, um, some after projects that are using this uh, uh, software stack. But still, for people that are not familiar with the Trusted Platform modules, um, I'm going to briefly describe what are the building blocks um, of these models. So, uh, TPM2 are crypto processors. So, um, they have a crypto processing unit to do, um, to create random numbers, to, to generate key for different ciphers. 
um, algorithms. And also they can do encryption and decryption by using the, the keys created by the TPM. And also has the ability to calculate hashes. Um, it also has um, volatile memory that can be used to store transient objects because the, the key created by the TPMs are not stored in the TPM, but you have to load it. We are going to explain more in detail about that. Um, so that memory is, is used to store those keys. And also it contains the platform configurated registers that are a set of registers that um, store hashes for, for things that have been measured. We're going to also to, to talk a little bit more about PCRs um, later in the talk. And finally, it has some non-volatile memory that can be used to persist um, um, objects in a secure way. And this memory also contains the seeds um, that are the root of trust of the hierarchy. These seeds are created when you initialize the TPMs. And all the primary keys are derivated from these seeds using a key derivation function. Um, and this primary key never leaves the TPMs and are the root of trust. So what are the features that TPM provide? Uh, as we said, it's able to, to generate random numbers. It can create keys and do encryption and decryption. It can also be used to identify the machines in a secure way. Um, can also store secrets in a secure way. And, and it can be used to measure the integrity of the system and to attest its health that has not been tampered with. Um, TPMs comes in different flavors. Um, there are hardware chips that sit on, a, on an actual bus, on, like SPI and I2C. Um, there are also firmware-based TPMs. For example, um, the TPM in this machine that we are presenting um, is a, is a firmware-based TPM. It doesn't have a real TPM uh, chip. As a side note, everyone that has a laptop that shipped in the last, oh, five to eight years you do have TPM. If you do have a laptop that's shipped in the last four or five years, it's almost certain to be TPM 2.0. Uh, part of the reason for this is that Microsoft requires uh, TPM 2.0 for Windows 10 certification. So any system that is Windows 10 certified will include a TPM 2.0. You may need to turn this on in the uh, BIOS, but uh, laptops and other client systems are pretty much guaranteed to include the TPM and server platforms increasingly provide them. That's true. Um, so, so one of the features of the TPM is the ability to store secrets. Um, so you can encrypt and decrypt um, data using the keys created here. As we mentioned, the keys are not stored in the TPM, but are stored outside the TPM, but protected by a primary key that never leaves the TPM. So that means that you can have um, as many keys as, as you want, um, which was a different with the older uh, TPM specification <coughs> where the keys were stored in the TPM. All the crypt operations happens inside the TPM, so um, are protected by, by, by the hardware chip. Um, and another feature of TPMs is the ability to seal data. Um, sealing means that you encrypt something um, and specify a policy. So uh, um, the TPM is only allowed to decrypt the data if that policy is met. We are also going to talk about sealing more uh, later. And um, something to keep in mind is that the TPMs are not crypto accelerators. In fact, they are very slow by design. So it should only be used to, to uh, encrypt uh, small secrets like keys, for example. This is an example of how to do encryption and decryption using the TPMs um, by using the TPM tools project. This is a project that is a set of command line tools to interact with the TPMs. Um, the TPM tools project uses the TPM2 software stack libraries. So it's a good starting point to wrap your head around the programming model of the TPMs. When I start with the TPMs, I, I had to read a lot of uh, specification and it was like really very complex to understand how to operate. So the TPM tools are, are useful for, for that uh, by looking at the integration test it has. And, um, and you, you probably can, can find the use case for, for a TPM that, that you're looking for. 
and they are also a good reference uh, code to, to understand how to use the, the TPM2 libraries. So in this example, we first create a primary key. Um, then we create a key that's going to be used to, to, to encrypt the, uh, the data. Once the key has been created, um, the key has to be loaded into the TPM so the TPM can use it. So then we can have some plain text to encrypt um, and use the TPM2 RSA encrypt command that encrypts um, that data in the TPM using the key that has been loaded. And then uh, we can also decrypt the data by using the TPM2 RSA decrypt command. Um, all the crypt operation happens inside the TPM. So um, the encrypted um, data is protected by, by the TPM and can only be decrypted in that particular machine. So um, as you said, it's not uh, hard to use the TPM, but still um, there is a lot of steps involved and um, there, there are many properties um, that has to be specific, specified when you create the, the primary key and the key and so on. So we tried to do this uh, a little easier, easier to use. So as Russell mentioned, we add support um, for TPMs to the Clevis project. Um, the Clevis project is an automated decryption framework um, that contains um, several pins. Each one of these pins um, implements a, a decryption policy and also um, specify a key store um, for the keys that are, are created by, by Clevis. Um, Clevis also has a set of command line tools um, to decrypt and encrypt data using these pins. And it also has um, the ability to bind a Lux volume to a pin. So you can automatically unlock your Lux volume if a certain policy is met. And it has several unlockers for, 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 to do this. Uh, there is one for, for it's a Dracut model, so you can unlock your, your Lux volume in the interim fast. It also has a, a, a UDIS uh, tube uh, plugin and also um, a command line that you can use. It's the Clevis Lux Unlock if you want to un unlock uh, a Lux volume explicitly. Uh, this is how Clevis works. Um, you need to provide some data to encrypt, um, a pin, for example, TPM, and a configuration. Um, Clevis has a uh, reasonable defaults, but Every pin has its own configuration if you want to tweak uh, the, the parameters. Um, so Clevis takes that information and, and generates a JSON web key that it is used to encrypt the data and the, the, the encrypted information and, inf and, and information on how to retrieve the key are stored in a JSON web encryption. And then the key is protected by the TPM. <coughs> On decryption, uh, you provide to Clevis a uh, JSON web encryption. Um, Clevis takes the information uh, about how to get the key from there, and also decipher uh, the text and, and, and retrieve the key and decrypt the data. So he, he's, he's an example of how to use Clevis. It is, it's a single command. Uh, you, you tell Clevis that you want to encrypt something, which pin to use, a configuration, and in this case, yeah, it's the defaults, uh, and you encrypt some, some, some uh, and it generates a JSON web encryption, and then if you want to decrypt, you provide to Clevis the JSON web encryption, and it decrypts. So I'm going to show here. So I, I'm encrypting something, and then I can decrypt. And, and Clevis returns the, I don't know if you see there. Right now. So as you can see, it's very uh, easy to use Clevis and, and you can also um, bind um, a looks volume, as uh, we said, to, to, a, to, to, to a, a pin. Uh, you just need to install the Clevis Dracut module then uh, generate your ERIFS so it contains the Clevis and, and the TPM's two libraries. Um, and you bind the deluxe volume and if you reboot your machine and the TPM is present, um, it will unlock um, the deluxe volume automatically in ERIFS. 
Um, so we showed now how to, to encrypt and decrypt data using um, uh, TPMs, but we, we mentioned that also you can seal um, uh, information. So now um, Russell is going to explain how sealing works and, and how the, the PCRs are used for that. So this is something that we're just starting to really use. And on the one hand, it's been around for a while. On the other hand, it hasn't been used. A lot of that is because the implementation in uh, TPM 1.2, for a variety of reasons, was very difficult to use. The <coughs> implementation in uh, TPM 2 is much easier to use. So what is uh, the measurement and sealing? Measurement is basically creating a hash of something. A hash of firmware, a hash of the uh, configuration, a hash of the bootloader, a hash of the kernel, anything else. So far, pretty straightforward and good, clean fun. So the TPM has a set of platform configuration registers, or PCRs. So you can take a hash and you can write it into a register. OK, that seems kind of obvious. So a couple of things here. You don't write it into a register. There is a TPM operation called extend. So you provide the hash value, and you extend that into a register. Now, when you come to the next hash value, you don't overwrite the register. The extend operation will take whatever is already in the um, register, do its kind of a glorified concatenation and reduction, but it uh, uses crypto operations to produce a new value. So, if you have, um, oh, let's take a random example. How about a kernel and five drivers that uh, you care about? You can hash the kernel and each of those five drivers, and as, as you do it, hash, extend, hash, extend, hash, extend, you end up with a PCR containing a single value that is the result of the specific measurements and the order that the measurements were taking it. The extension operation is done entirely inside the uh, TPM. And this can be used uh, as part of more complex operations called um, sealing. So <clears throat> the thing here is that this can be used in a number of rather interesting ways. It is dependent on the contents of the things that are being measured and the order that measurements are taken. It is reproducible. If you have the same set of things being measured and you measure them in the same order, you will get the same results. This is interesting because you have things that um, are common. For example, you can have a measurement of a BIOS and that measurement will be valid for any installation of that BIOS. The BIOS May, uh, maker can publish the measurements of that uh, BIOS, and this can be used to determine if the BIOS has been modified or corrupted. So it can be anything from a single file on the system to uh, universal things like a BIOS. So, <clears throat> Tavier, do you want to go into the PCRs or do you want me to do that? No, you can do it. Okay. We don't have. So the interesting thing here is that there are a set of 24 PCRs. Some of them are very low level, like the BIOS and the BIOS configuration. Is anyone looking at uh, PCR number two, uh, um, option ROMs, and wondering what that is all about? So do any of your systems have a disk controller or a network controller in them? So what is happening is that we can measure all the firmware on the different devices in the system. <clears throat> One of the attack vectors is that um, advanced persistent threats <clears throat> rootkits in the BIOS of peripherals. We have the ability to check the uh, <clears throat> BIOS in the peripherals and determine if the peripherals themselves have been modified or corrupted. <clears throat> we can come down and we can do the uh, bootloader, the master boot record. We can uh, check 
oh, straight transition, state transitions and uh, wake up events. Uh, we can measure the operating system and uh, there are registers available to use so you can build custom applications. Okay, this may sound vaguely interesting, but it also sounds like there would be a lot of work to implement it and a lot of opportunities to uh, mess things up. A couple of things. PCRs zero through three are extended by the hardware and the TPM. The low level hardware and the TPM measure the key parts of the system. So you now have a mechanism to determine if your BIOS BIOS configuration and device firmware has been modified or corrupted. Uh, Steve, um, Peter Jones has been implementing extensions to the shim and bootloader to add additional measurements such that uh, the shim and the bootloader are now providing measurements for uh, the shim and the bootloader, for uh, the system certificates, kernel and grub commands, so we now have, as a standard part of booting the system, a set of valuable and useful measurements, PCR measurements, being done for you that are available to use. Uh, more information on it, github.com, rhboot, shem, and you can get the details on that. So, let's tie these two together. We talked a moment ago about <clears throat> encrypting and decrypting secrets using the TPM. With sealing, we can seal uh, the, uh, the secret operation with a set of PCR values, which means that the secret will only be decrypted if those PCR measurements match what was used for sealing it. So, Tavir, this might be a useful place to show an example. Yeah. Um, previously, we, we, we show how to encrypt and decrypt data using Clevis. Uh, but you can also, and, and, and we use um, the default. Can you see there, or should I make it bigger? It's, uh, doesn't fit anymore. Okay. So, we use the default uh, configuration for the TPN2 pin. Here, this time, we will pass uh, a PCR's ID um, argument. So we will say um, we want to encrypt, but also we want to seal against the PCR number zero. So we generate the, the JSON <coughs> web encryption. And we can decrypt this without problem. But if we, we have... Um, a value of in, in, in the PCR um, register zero with a hash. So if we change that hash, for example, with an extend operation, um, um, TPM won't be able to decrypt the secret anymore. So le let's use the, the extend command to um, extend some hash, for example, of a, a test string. and then we have a different um, hash in the PCR zero. So this time, if we try to decrypt our secret, um, the TPM will, will not allow us to do that. So Clevis uh, w wasn't able to get the JSON web key because um, the PCR policy that was used to encrypt wasn't met. So uh, measurement and, 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 and and PCRs are only one part of, of, of the puzzle, uh, but we also need um, something that's called attestation, and Russell is going to talk about that. Okay. So, have any of you taken a Linux system disk from one computer and moved it to another computer and run it? Or have you cloned a disk to get a disk that uh, will run on another system? Well, if you're using Clevis with Lux, and particularly if you're sealing, you can, you have set it up such that the disk will not boot on anything but the system it was originally configured on, and that it will not boot 
if someone has messed with the uh, BIOS or has turned off secure boot or has done a number of um, other things. So this provides a very strong capability for locking down systems. So in the simple case here is basically we just showed seal and um, then check it. So good starting point. It does have some limits in its flexibility. The next thing to do is to begin providing um, comparison of the PCR measurements outside the um, direct ceiling. This can be done either by having a list of good values on the system. So basically, uh, BIOS manufacturer would provide a list of the um, PCR values for different BIOS versions. So you would be able to um, upgrade the BIOS without uh, breaking your system. Useful. <clears throat> if the list is kept on the local system, this is known as uh, static attestation. But it also, uh, there is a broader one, which is take the various sealed PCR values, make them available outside the uh, system, and allow a external server to determine if this set of PCR measurements is valid or if the system has been compromised. So there are several systems that uh, either exist or are under development for implementing dynamic app testation. Uh, some examples of this would include the Keyline project, the Intel OpenCIT um, system, and the uh, Strong One package has uh, some fairly extensive capabilities here. So there are a number of uh, things that you can do directly with uh, PCRs and PCR sealing. There are also some systems that begin to build on this. Okay, signing. Everyone here knows what signing is. It took me a little while to figure it out. Um, I'm somewhat slow. The people that know me can, will assure you of that. So signing. Signing means you take a hash of the data, you <clears throat> encrypt it with a private key, and then with a public key, you can verify that <clears throat> the data was signed with a defined private key, and that since it's uh, the hash, that the data in the uh, file has not been corrupted or modified. So good stuff. We use signing all over the place. It's really the foundation of uh, much computer security. So <clears throat> the thing that uh, you can begin to do with TPM is you can do the signing operation in hardware. So the signing operation is entirely inside the TPM, inside the secure uh, security processor boundaries and can only be done by that one specific TPM. So TPM signing gives you the ability to prove that a uh, file was signed by a specific system and that uh, you do not have the situation of someone being able to copy your private key off someplace else and start uh, signing things. Now, Traditionally, this has been somewhat challenging to do using TPM. Uh, Javier, has that changed? Yeah, now, uh, here we have an example of how to do signing. Again, you see the TPM tools. Um, so you create a prim primary key, like in the previous example, then you create a key, um, you load the key, that's the same that um, the, the last example, and then there is a TPM to sign. Um, command that um, can use that loaded key to sign some, some data, the hash of, of some data. And that gives us a signature that contains the signed hash. And since only the, the private portion of the, of the key is protected by the TPM, because it's wrapped by the primary key, the public key can be loaded um, in any TPM. So, Another user can use the TPN2 load external um, tool um, that, it, that 
allows to, to, to load um, keys that were not created by that particular TPM. So can load the public portion of the key and use the TPM2 verify signature um, to check that the hash for that data and the signature um, matches. Um, so we have some demos uh, of interesting um, upstream projects that are using the, the TPM2 uh, software stack. Uh, we already show some examples using Clavis, uh, but have, uh, we have another one. Um, and also there are two uh, projects that are under development uh, and they don't have a release yet, but we, by, we uh, um, on our test are working pretty well, even when don't have a release yet. Uh, one is the TPM2 TSS engine, that is an OpenSL engine for TPM2. And the other one is the TPM2 uh, PKCS11 project that, is, uh, that provides a PKCS11 interface for TPMs too. So the demos we have uh, for Clevis is um, to automatically unlock uh, a Lux volume using uh, the, the, the UDIS2 support. Um, for the OpenSSL uh, engine, um, we have a demo to show how a, a, a private key of a cert can be protected by a TPM. And uh, finally, for the PKCS11 one, uh, we will show how uh, um, uh, OpenSSH um, private key can be protected by the TPM. So, as we mentioned, uh, Clevis allows to bind uh, um, a Lux volume to a pin. So, in this example, we, we have uh, an external uh, uh, USB drive that, that will be unlocked automatically by Clevis. So I'm gonna plug in on my computer. And even when it has um, a Lux volume uh, on it, uh, it will be unlocked automatically because um, the, the Clevis unlock, unlocker was able to do it. So. So we see that yeah, it has been uh, um, mount, unlock and mount in, in, in my system, and I didn't have to provide any, any fast rate for that. So this is, for example, useful for, for backup solution if you, you uh, don't, need, don't want to, to enter your pass rate every time that you want to, to, to copy something, but if someone steals your disk, won't be able to, to automatically unlock the Lux volume. Only in your system, because it's, it's protected by a key that has to be loaded into your TPM. So, and as Russell mentioned, uh, you can also seal your, your Lux uh, key um, using a, a, a PCR policy. So only, for example, only if uh, my secure boot configuration uh, uh, is the same or if my firmware didn't change, uh, unlock automatically. Otherwise, ask for a fast rate. So, so I, cannot, I can unlock. Um. So, you can back up for one second. This specific example, it is <clears throat> going to be checking to see if the system firmware is unmodified, if the option ROMs or the device firmware is um, unmodified, and if the system is in secure boot mode. So a lot of things that you can check. This would be uh, a simple yet very useful capability that would give you a strong indication that uh, you're booting a secure, unmodified system. So the next example um, is to protect uh, a private key of a cer certificate um, using the TPM. So uh, the, the TPM, uh, the OpenSL engine for TPM has this uh, TPM2 TSS gen key that generates a, a RSA key um, using the TPM. So then you can use uh, OpenSL and specify that you are using the, the, the TPN2 TSS <coughs> engine uh, to, to generate a, a certificate uh, signing request and a certificate and so on. And then you can, for example, uh, use the OpenSL as uh, server uh, um, uh, tool to, to, to start. Okay. We only have five minutes, so I'm going to do this very quickly. So here we have... Um, 
a private key that uh, is it's a pen key with a label TSS. So, so OpenSSL knows that it, it, it has to use the TPN2 engine for that. And we will start a server on a client here. And we see that they, they are able to, to sell it a, a TLS connection and the, the client is using the certificate um, that, that is associated with, with, with that private key. So um, it's, if someone steals your, your private key, um, the attacker cannot do, a, a, for example, a man in the middle attack uh, because that private key can only be used in that particular machine. Um, the last example um, is uh, to protect uh, uh, SSH uh, private key. So you see in the PKCS11 uh, um, interface, um, we, you can generate a, a, pli a, pi a public key associated with, 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 with um, your private key, and, and you, you copy to the um, to the server, and, and then you tell SSH. Um, since SSH has support for PKCS11, you, 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 you specify that you want to use the, the uh, lib TPN2 PKCS11. And, uh, let's see, here. I can establish, uh, I, I can authenticate using that key, and you can see here um, that the client, it's, uh, where is it? The, that the, the client offers a, 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 a PKCS11 public key, and the server accepts that key, so you can authenticate uh, using um, your key that is protected by the TPM. So again, if someone steals your private key, uh, the attacker won't be able to access um, that machine because it can only be used by loading into your TPM in that machine. So it's, prote it's another uh, level of protection for, for your for your secrets. Um, so yeah, we, we, we show some examples how to use TPMs and, 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 and what, uh, what these, these models are useful. Um, and now Russell is going to um, talk a little bit about other use cases. Actually, this is a almost a <coughs> plea because um, I think we've demonstrated that there are some useful and powerful capabilities with a hardware root of trust today, that we're beginning to do useful things with this hardware root of trust, and that it is actually quite easy to use. Uh, it is dramatically easier to use than it's been in the past, and we've been demonstrating with uh, even these early efforts that we can provide significant levels of hardware-backed security that are transparent to the user. Transparent to the user. Hallelujah, maybe people will actually start using this stuff. <clears throat> but as I said, we're just scratching the surface. These are some uh, things that we're looking at for uh, potential uses of TPM. Um, I put this list together a few weeks ago, so Javier has already moved beyond me. I need to uh, take some of these things off the uh, potential list. Uh, but there are um, a lot of other things out there. So if uh, the hardware root of trust back security would be useful for any of the projects that you're working on, we encourage you to use it. Any and all the uh, upstream projects building on TPM can of course use uh, additional assistance. We would love to uh, have people working with it. And if you uh, start getting into these things, there are a set of resources. Uh, a really good starting point, if you want to know the details of this, <coughs> is a practical guide to TPM 2.0, 250-page um, uh, book, which is available as a free electronic uh, book from uh, A Press. There's more information available from the Trusted Computing Group. <coughs> the uh, user space tools you have listed for the IBM and for the Trusted Computing Groups. Uh, Clevis and the work that uh, Javier and the other engineers are doing with network-bound disk encryption, and uh, the work going on with OpenSSL and PKCS11. And by incredible coincidence, as the out of time sign came up, we got to the point of, do you have any questions, comment, or feedback? <laughs>
Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for such an interesting uh, uh, explanation of uh, an incredible topic. Entertaining? Informative. Uh, but I have a question regarding uh, the support of TPM and GPG and uh, how, how maybe is there a possibility uh, to use it uh, with a GPG uh, out of the box? Have you looked into this? No, not I, I, I don't know if there are some efforts on that. I, I, I have to check. So with this, or would you yeah. be looking at specific things is, is like uh, hardware root trust support in uh, PGP? Uh, no, no I, I would like to uh, protect my uh, pilot key, pilot uh, GPG key, and... Uh, oh, ab absolutely. With the, the, with the simple instructions we have here, uh, we've shown you exactly what you need to do to uh, take a secret, such as a GPG uh, private key and <clears throat> store it into the TPM with or without sealing. So you can do that today. I do not think it will work with GPG. Yeah, I do not think it will work with GPG. GPG doesn't support like, so any open SSL engines. It doesn't support any PKC SSL modules. It's just using their thing that so the two things here are you can use uh, TPM outside of uh, PGP. The simplest case would be with a script, and this is where you should point out that that's an ugly and uh, incomplete answer, and I would agree with you completely and say that a, P a uh, GPG implementation such as PGP can be extended to uh, use this capability and I have to admit that that work has not been done. Um, have, yeah, have I don't thoughts? know if there are efforts already to do that. Because of what you said, if you encrypt the key using the TPM, you will store the, the key at some point unencrypted in your, your file system. So I, it, we need proper support in GPG for that. Good idea. Is it common to support for TPM uh, to on the system without secure boot and effort. Is it related? Um, no, it is, it's, it's not related. It's, it's, you have secure boot and trusted boot. They are separate things. Um, you can use, you can connect it, for example, by using measurements. So you can say, I'm going to seal this data if my secure boot configuration didn't change. For example, if, if a secure boot wasn't disabled or the keys replaced it, for example. But there are separate things because secure boot is active. If um, your binary is not signed by one of the keys in, in your, your of trust, that binary won't be executed. But uh, TPMs only measure what you, the boot components, and, and it doesn't take any action for you. You can use the information in the PCR state to say, for example, I, don't, I won't decrypt this. But the TPMs don't do nothing uh, by itself. TPM in this case extends secure boot. And there are uh, a couple of obvious attack vectors on secure boot. One of them is turning secure boot off. Uh, that's kind of hard to defend against. The other is to add new signing keys to the uh, mock list. So <clears throat> both of those would um, allow you to boot with a uh, unsigned uh, firm. What you can do with TPM is that uh, you can seal it both to check that secure boot is enabled, and you can also seal the uh, signing keys to make sure that no one has added a key to the approved signing key list. So it's able to extend secure boot but if someone wants to uh, turn secure boot off, yeah, they can. For example, in, in power platforms, you have trusted boot because you have the TPM there, but you don't have secure boot. So th there, are, there is no dependency between. Them. Yeah, I think last question because we run out of time. Where 
recover data because it's in a risk of my The question was, how do I prepare for my TPM module dying for my system that uh, incorporates the TPM module dying? <clears throat> TPM is not a backup. So you need to uh, make sure that your data is backed up outside the system. And one of the uh, things is you have a mechanism and an approach for placing data in the TPM initially. You would need to be able to uh, recreate that data. So if you have um, keys only in the TPM, that is a risk of uh, hardware failure. And since we're getting the uh, hook over here, uh, thank you very much for attending this session. Javier and I will be just on the other side of the door and delighted to continue this conversation for as many hours as you care. That's all.